Um, good afternoon and welcome, uh, welcome everyone to our artist talk for the Good Trip Art Bears New Exhibition on the Barra Tile, which means renewal of the earth. My name is Laurie McGowan Dockman and I work in the Adult Programs Department at the Library. Today we will hear from the three artists who have worked collaboratively on this exhibition, which explores the delicate ecological balance between the health of the planet and that of ourselves. The show features two-dimensional and three-dimensional works of art, which are installed both in the gallery and in the Ruggles Fine Arts Reading Room in the upper level section of the library's Morris Building. A few words about each artist. Jean Lindell okay, is an ecologically-minded visual artist, educator, writer, and native plant enthusiast. She is thrilled to be working on this exhibit with Karina Chong, one of her former students, Jean has exhibited her work in both group and solo shows in Connecticut and New York. She serves on the Ritual Conservation Commission and volunteers at the Increase Farm of Ritual. Jean holds a PhD in Interdisciplinary Studies from Union Institute University. Karina John. Sitting next to Jean. Is an artist with activist concerns. Karina has been awarded several fellowships and residencies including a Jack and Natasha Gelman Fine Arts Travel Fellowship to explore delicate nuances of glass making in Hirano, Italy, and Firazabad, India, and a Fulbright Hall Fellowship to teach, research, and learn about glass and ceramics making processes within various provinces of China. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally. She received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Rhode Island School of Design. Abby Carson, you know that, is a former art director who worked in New York City before moving to Ridgefield. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Atlantic College of Art in Advertising Illustration. She is currently pursuing a certificate from the New York Botanical Garden in Botanical Art. Abby sees plants from the eyes of an ecologist, looking at their health and effects of our ever-changing environment upon them. Thank you, Lori. Uh, before we begin, I really want to I want to thank the library and I want to thank uh, Lori and Lucy for their persistence. <laughs> this exhibition was originally slated for March of 2020, and we all know how that went. So um, it's, uh, it's it's been a, an act of patience and, and persistence on their part, and also for their willingness to let us push the boundaries of the exhibit space. Um, normally, the artists use the gallery space, and we specifically requested that we use the Morris building. And part of the reason why is um, whenever I do an exhibition, I tend to do site-specific work. And so I spend time in a location, get to know it, and then incorporate that into what the body of work that's produced. So when we decided that we were going to do a show at the library, that became my site. And so I started really reflecting on that. And I have such incredibly warm memories of a small library in upstate New York that I used to visit very regularly who had wonderful natural history collections. You know, the old drawers, you could open it up and the butterflies were laid out in there. And the boxes that you'd open and there'd be a beautiful gemstone in it. And I wanted to bring part of that history back to this library. And so that's why we specifically asked if we could use the Morris. And the, the library graciously um, said yes. So we're very, very thankful that we could make that part of the exhibition completion. So um, what I want to do, first of all, is encourage you, I like to think of things as being more of a conversation than a lecture. So at any time, if anybody has something they want to say or a question, please feel free to. You don't have to try to remember that question until the end of the presentation, which I know I always struggle with. So um, I wanted to take a minute just to talk about the history of this exhibition. Uh, Lori mentioned that Karina was a former student of mine. I taught in the public schools in New York State for uh, 33 years. And um, Karina walked into my room as a kindergartner initially. And um, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> and we periodically share memory. It's always interesting to hear a student's perspective, you know, decades after the fact. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but then it, about midway through my career, I transitioned to a high school. And lo and behold, Karina walked into my art room again as a high school student. So 
somewhere we connect to her. We've always stayed in contact when she was uh, accepted into WISD. I still have my WISD t-shirt. <laughs> um, and we always stayed in contact. So the picture on the upper left was from uh, the high school class uh, with some of her other <laughs> partners in crime in one of the classes. And then the image below it is us having tea in Peekskill whenever she was stateside. You know, as you heard from her intro, she traveled a great deal. She was living in Morocco, she was in the Arctic, she was in China, she was in India, she was in Italy, and I lived vicariously through her <laughs> travel. <laughs> um, but whenever she was stateside, I was always graced by an email, a text, a phone call saying, let's get together. And it was great. Um, and so, about 2018, right, Karina? Maybe 2017? Yeah. We were back, and she, she said to me, Gene, you know, we should really do an exhibit together. And I think probably my response was, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, had, uh, I had a period of pretty extensive exhibiting from 2003 to about 2013, where I was doing solo shows almost every year. And I was tired. <laughs> And so I had taken a little bit of a break from it. So I was also teaching full time during that whole time. And so I, I had really kind of put the exhibition saga behind me. I would do some group shows, submit stuff, but I really wasn't looking into larger and everything. And then she left, and I'm sitting there at home, and I'm thinking to myself, Jean, how often do you ever get a chance that a student is going to come back to you and say, can we do an exhibition here? I said, <laughs> so um, I reached out to Kringle and I said, absolutely, let's do this. Let's make it happen. So um, we like to say that we were ahead of the curve by about two years, right? <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll do it on my curve. <laughs> 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 I just moved, so it's quite a curve all the way. She lives in California <laughs> now. So um, yeah, so anyways. We started planning this exhibit, but she was living in Italy, and you were also in Morocco and in England, I think, during the course of that time, correct? And so we were what's happening before the world was zooming. <laughs> so we had two years of practice of virtual communication, because that's how we did it. And the whole show was planned that way. So we would actually have these, you know, um, video meetings with each other. We'd be showing each other our sketchbooks, we'd be showing each other the work that we were working on, we'd be asking each other for suggestions, and oh, Karina, I need another glass globe, can you blow me another globe? <laughs> you know, it's like having like all these conversations, and whenever she was stateside, we would um, get together and kind of have these condensed, you know, sit-downs of like, where are we, where are we heading, how are we pulling this all together? Um, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, I guess uh, the work's evolved quite a bit from like, the very beginning with like, certain ideas. And as we got into lockdown, I couldn't act on half of my work because <laughs> it's all on a storage unit in Italy. So I actually created more work while we were under COVID restrictions. So I think um, it all happened very organically. And I think the process of how we collaborated and, and the friendship deepened through Experiences. So I think I, I value the tangible assets of what came out of the struggles and tribulations of trying to connect with each other. We really grew and our work evolved in ways that we both probably couldn't have met and imagined. Yeah, I mean, and that's really the real, one of the real lessons behind Renovale is the fact that all the work that's up there would never have happened without collaboration. And I think that that's the message going forward for trying to renew the earth. I, you know, it's very intentional that we're sitting here uh, on spring equinox, right? Mm -hmm. We are here with the even amount of daylight and the even amount of darkness. And we are now going to be heading into longer daylight. And I like to think that environmentally that we're beginning to awaken to this too and that we can have a spring awakening to that as far as that. We need to realize that it's going to take collaboration and that we need to work together and we need to work to renew the earth as much as we possibly can. So, so Karina mentions the lockdown. So what, what was happening was that you could not even access your studio in Morano because you had to take a boat. Studio. 
And in Italy, they went into lockdown much more serious than we did here and sooner. So here we are, thinking we're heading to the finish line of this exhibition in March of 2020. And we're talking, and she's like, you know, I really can't leave my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we started getting concerned. We were getting concerned about whether she would get out of Italy, which proved to be the case. You could not go. Yeah, I tried to change my ticket, but I couldn't even leave at that point. So I either finish the work or leave. So I kind of had to balance the two. So, and at that point, things started um, escalating here in the States. And so it became really evident, and then we started having conversations with the folks at the library, and we knew that, you know, the exhibition wasn't going to happen in March. And so that's, that's when we kind of went into this pandemic mode of, you know, you were in Italy, I was here, we all boxed up our stuff, <laughs> put it in storage, and said, what's next? And, um, I volunteer at the Hickories, and my cohort is Abby Carson. <laughs> and so during the pandemic, you know, we were relegated to our field. <laughs> and so Abby and I would show up and work in the field, and the more we talked and spent time together, um, I just felt like we needed to collaborate with Abby on this exhibit because she brings to the work a very different side of what Corinne and I were bringing to this message of get to know your world and let's work to renew it. And so I asked her if she would join us. I got on the WhatsApp call with Karina and I said, you know, how do you feel about bringing in another person to the show? So that's how Abby came to, to join our group and we're thrilled to, to have her with us. So um, that kind of gives you a little bit of a background. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is we also had a really intentional message behind the work as well, which was we wanted to present micro to macro. So what do we mean by that? All the work that I created in the exhibition was inspired by and all the materials were gathered on a third of an acre that I live on in Richfield. So it's a pretty micro. Okay. Abby's work, you encompass. I encompass my own area in my, at, at my own lawn, yard, garden, home, which is a half an acre, as well as at the Hickories, because a lot of my work there has to do with documentation of the plants and how they're growing, as well as the insects that feed on them and use them for their, their own work. So um, I'm in those two spaces, and during pandemic, I was there solely in those two spaces. <laughs> Very much. Right. So her micro is a little bit bigger than my micro. All right, and then we jump to Karina's macro, right, of literally, you know, traveling the globe. And what's really interesting, and I think you'll notice this in particularly a couple of pieces that are in the show. Um, there's one that's right outside the door. Uh, that's photographs that are in the chakra colors. And one side are my photographs and one side are Karina's. And we shot those entirely independently of each other. The only plan we had was that we were going to do natural objects and we were going to tint them to be in the chakras. That was the guidelines we gave each other. And when we were comparing our images, when we kind of hashed them all together, it was incredible how similar they were. And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on that because as we were setting the show up, and I hadn't seen a lot of I had seen some of their work here and there, but like Corinna's was you know away in in her spaces, and Jean's was all packed up in her spaces for the last two years since the demise of the other show, and um, and so I'm looking at all of them, and I'm seeing so many threads that can absolutely combine all of our work together because Corinna has a very large wasp nest upstairs and my work at the Hickories was with with a um, one of my pieces up there has to do with a wasp that makes the same type of nest and a number of the pieces that I have in the in work down here has seed Seed, Jean has seeds from many of those plants that I have in mind. So 
it all seems to be, even though we were independent of each other in some ways, we were very connected. And, and I think that that's you know, the thing that I think everyone across the globe has realized through the pandemic. It's, it's really made concrete how connected we all are. And what we need to do now is take the jump from the pandemic, from a virus, to say, yeah, our air, our water, our soil, the overall health of our ecological systems, they're equally the same. It's all the same, whether it's a micro or a macro scale. And so that's really what our focus is was on the show. And just that I think it became evident through the work, like you were saying, that no matter the scale, the thread's the same. Why? Because it's one planet. <laughs> There's only so many threads you can have as far as what sustains life. So does anybody have any questions at this point before I hand the floor over, so to speak, to you, Karina, to talk a little bit more about some of your explorations in your work? Does anybody, like I said, feel free? Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, Karina. All right, so I guess um, listening to this exploration that I went to in 2015 in uh, Svalbard, Norway, and as you know, um, there's also a world seed bank in uh, Svalbard. So I went to visit that place and I had the opportunity to sail on a fall ship for two weeks on this boat uh, around the um, coast of Norway. So I packed my bag and I <coughs> packed some essentials of what I thought I would need to document um, this journey. Uh, glaciers there have been slowly melting past 30 years, so finding ways to highlight the unseen and seen processes of how things have started to diminish. I, um, I had one of the pieces out, outside with a uh, tracing of um, an iceberg just to show the duration of how much time it takes for these objects um, to disappear. And um, through that, I I also looked at elemental aspects of, I went uh, during June, um, so that's when the summer sol solstice was happening, and there's sun like 24 hours a day, and I was very intrigued by that notion of um, finding a way to document that, how we see light in different parts of the world. And um, I started this journey of trying to trace an object and its shadow and find <coughs> You'll see the piece um, in Morocco, the skins outside, um, was a sort of development of that journey of trying to figure out how to um, extract these local and foreign objects that we find and find ways to give it relevance to the ecosystem and the industry. Um, so this is a map. Uh, and I both made maps. Um, so this actually became a very meditative process of writing of the earth where it's a map of all the places I've been to in the past decade. Um, and so you can see my footprint has <laughs> become a little larger than the rest of us. But um, just a, a way to find relevance in this world where everything's very fast paced slow it down and, and um, find ways to connect the dots of our existence. And it's interesting, you know, again, this, this parallel universe that we did all the tracings in, I also developed the piece that's outside by the elevator, it's the window. And if you look at that, there's a tracing in the middle, it's where I set up a branch in my front yard and I traced it at three different times during one day, so you can see its movement. And then the scroll is actually the shadow that it casts on the shortest day of the year, which is when the longest shadows are cast, which seems counterintuitive, but that's exactly what happens. And then the, the window was each segment, there's 12 of them, is one month, and the wedge there is mathematically calculated to exhibit a length of daylight within that time. So each stripe within that panel is a day. So it's actually a visualization of how 
the light increases and decreases throughout the months of the year. So again, it was like this underlying thing that we, we both were working on, but in very different ways. So, yeah. Do you want to say anything else about your glass work or anything? Glass has been a material that I've been dedicated to for over 19 years. Um, it's always in, in my daily routine when I'm in a fixed location. So I, I haven't ever really prescribed any given material as how I identify, but I predominantly work as a glass maker in Murano and I've been honing skills. So some of the specimens that I've created upstairs are pretty anatomically precise um, detailed uh, recreations of insects or skeletons that I've collected. Um, so I guess that's uh, something that I also do. Been very well. <laughs> Um, as we said, the pandemic happened, packed up all the stuff, and I have to say, I think both of us were really, we were in a funk, you know, and we were trying to buoy each other over a distance. That when, you, when you've been working for two years, which really we started seriously in 2018, doing the work for this show, it was like the rug was pulled out underneath us suddenly, and it's like, now what do we do? Like, you know, it's like, wow, what's happening? And um, so it was, um, you know, we, we both, I think, kind of, it took us a lot to kind of find the rhythm, but one of the things that I did, and it's, I'm thrilled to see Barb here in the audience, um, I have always played around with poetry for quite some time, and felt, you know, oh, I really need to maybe take this a little more seriously and work on developing my craft, and so I said, well, this is a perfect opportunity, and I saw an ad that Barb was doing these poetry groups once a month, and it was going to be on Zoom, and I said, this is perfect, so I'll do it. So I made a commitment to myself that I was going to take that step and stick my toe into this world and see how it was, which was, um, it felt like a risk, but I felt this is the time to do it, so I did it. Um, at the same time, when I have done the initial show, there's a piece out here that has 12 wood panels on it that has um, glass lenses, courtesy of Karina, um, where I was focusing on trying to capture what, what was happening on my property. And the idea of doing four seasons was like, there's no way I could fit all that stuff on one panel for a season. So I thought, well, let me do 12 months. And I'll, you know, I, that'll be plenty of stuff that I can do a panel for each month and it will be no problem. Well, when I completed that piece, I completed it shortly before our exhibition was supposed to open. I had realized in spending time on my property that this was nowhere near right. Like a month was still way too big. There was still too much happening, too many changes and transitions happening within my little ecosystem within a month to make it stand on its own. And so I started looking around and I found about uh, this idea of micro seasons, which has been present in Asian cultures and originated in China. Um, the Japanese have been more about supporting it forward into modern times, I find. But they look at the lunar and solar cycles, and basically the year is divided into 72 seasons, each of which are about five days long. And I became really intrigued by this. And so I decided that I was going to give myself a challenge, and I thought, why not? I decided to do a blog every five days on my website where I would write a poem about what I had seen, and I would take images and post the images with it. And I've now been doing it for almost two years straight. Okay, on April 22nd of this year, I'll be doing my last post, and it'll be my 144th post, which is also a Fibonacci number. And Fibonacci is very near and dear to my heart, so I feel that Fibonacci is telling me it's time to pause at 144 and to reevaluate. So, so basically what I decided to do with uh, this last year was to do this piece, which is called One Year, 72 Seasons, where I observed things, I made little collections, and so each of these books you can take out of this piece and you can open it, and there's a, an object in there, and there's a one word that's taken from one of the poems that I wrote during this time. Um, and I was working on it, and I just, I had reached this kind of point in January where something was not clicking, it wasn't crossing the finish line for me, and I, go into my workshop, I'd stare at it, go back out, 
back in. And, um, and then the New York Times arrived in, in January, and I read this article where they were talking about the state of the environment uh, worldwide. And there's many countries in this globe, but they decided to look at the current standing of the climate situation in 72 countries. So, <laughs> inside of each of these books now is a little scroll from that article that highlights each of the 72 countries that was profiled in that New York Times article and listen to what's happening and also walk away from things when they're not working quite right and, and honor that something will come forward and, and be offered to you. And that's what happened here. So, um, so that's like one of the blogs um, that came out a couple of days ago. And then, you know, it's uh, what's happening next. I've really become enraptured with this and I, I feel that I've learned so much from these two years of looking at my little property every five days and like honing in on what's changed and what's happened to it. And so kind of what I'm hoping to do once this, this show is going to be closing its doors at some point is to develop a, a resource for other people that has poems, photographs, and it's like a garden journal for like how do you look at an ecological space every five days? to notice what's happening in it. And I think that um, it's something I'm really excited about, and that's kind of like the next project I'm doing, so it's not necessarily a sculpture, but it's gonna kind of be an encapsulation of so much of what um, I've experienced over the course of, of, of doing this exhibition that you so crazily suggested, and I'm so thankful that you suggested that. <laughs> I don't remember the name my idea had <laughs> it was, trust me. I wouldn't have come up with that. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. So now, Abby. And here we are with mine. <laughs> so, um, my whole, um, my four pieces that are right outside here did go through each of the season. Each season had everything within that summer, Spring, etc., has to do with the season in New York. And I also, just to jump off of what Jean was saying for the future, is that I also I started last March with my four seasons, but this March I'm beginning with a sketchbook that I am documenting every few days what is going on in my part. And I typically walk every day and look at what's happening along the road and seeing what's growing and come back to my garden and look and see if those same things are coming up because, you know, the health of the planet around you and in your community is very, very much the same, you're hoping, as what you have in your own space. And over this year, I have been taking some classes at the New York Botanical Garden in Botanical Art and when um, Jean and I were discussing, Brenna were discussing this project that they were working on, we thought, boy, you're kind of doing the same thing that we're doing. You we might as well, you know, continue to do it. So this whole year has been spent doing that. And this, this, this is from my garden, the, the uh, butterfly weed plant, just in the late fall when it was starting to uh, release its seed. And this is the piece that I did once the winter came along. I took that piece into my studio and drew that. And I use uh, primarily colored pencil and watercolor. And I've always used colored pencil, but this past year I've been working with more of the watercolor and drawing it extremely. And the thing about watercolor and colored pencil is that you have to layer upon layer upon layer of, of color until you finally get to the saturation and, and depth that you want. And it's the same with the seasons. They layer upon each other as they come along. I mean, spring falls into summer, which then dries into fall, which then the snows of winter come in. You know, cover, you know, cover all of that. So it's very, very similar in that way. 
And I've had a really wonderful time doing this work, and um, also at the hickories, I mentioned earlier, documenting all of those plants photographically, so the two pieces that are upstairs are from the fields and some of the insects that I uh, do um, observe over that time. And she literally walks every, every day. <laughs> we live not far from each other, and we actually, I am looking for two days a week. <laughs> two days a week, I, I make sure I'm up early, <laughs> and, and we meet at a meeting point and continue our walk, and we walk, so it's, it's really, but she's so dedicated to it, and it's really, it's really just wonderful. And, and the project that we work on in the Hickories, actually some of you may or may not be aware of, and you can learn more about it <laughs> on Tuesday, here's a plug. Uh, we're doing a talk for the Garden Clubs. We're involved with the Ecotech project at the Hickories, which is specifically focused on, it's a farmer-led initiative of giving farmers another crop, but it's also doing seed amplification of local Ecotech native plants. Um, and it's, a, it's fascinating, and it's, it's good work. It's a work I'm uh, proud to be associated with. And um, Medina Brewster, maybe you know her, at the Hickories is just a phenomenal woman to work with. Idea person. Yeah. And this is proving to be a very good idea. <laughs> so, um, before we open up to more questions or comments or whatever, um, there we mentioned that there is uh, work up in the Morris room, so please look at that. There are library cards attached to the wall next to each piece. They're meant to be taken out. And inside is information about pieces or travels or locations. We each kind of approach it a little bit differently, so please interact with it. Um, your, your watch is listening. <laughs> um, and the, um, the piece I showed you earlier with the books, feel free to pick your favorite number, find your birthday, pull out the book, take a look, see what's in there, get to know what's happening in Ridgefield around that day. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is that we are doing a, a pop-up installation at the Hickory's that will be installed on the 15th of April, will run until April 22nd. And on April 22nd, we're gonna do, because it happens to be Earth Day, very appropriate for the show to end on that day. We're gonna do a little afternoon of Earth Day activities out at the farm. We're gonna have uh, the three of us available for a, more of a chat, and you can see the work out there. Uh, Hopefully we're going to have a couple of environmental poets doing some reading. We might have a little making of seed bomb activity with some native seeds. So it'll be a really nice afternoon. So we hope we can see you again maybe in April. Does anybody else want to, did something else pop into your mind that you want to share?
right? There weren't enough bees to spread enough pollen to make that cucumber grow out fully. And it's becoming, for home gardeners, for commercial growers, it's becoming more of a problem because of this decline of overall pollinators. And it's beyond, like, you know, we're not really talking honeybees here at all because honeybees are not one of our native bees. We're talking about our native bees, our native flies, beetles, uh, ants pollinate, you know, all of these other factors. So that was how it was started. And so um, Dina came to me and she goes, gee, <laughs> I have this idea. What do you think? And at the time, I had been working more on the event side for the hickories, doing their flower arrangements for events. And I really was, I wasn't happy uh, ethically with that because we were growing these beautiful flowers and we were cutting them in their prime. They were getting used to like a one day event and that was it. And so I was, I was kind of chafing a little bit and looking for something when she happened to come to me with this idea of getting involved with the Ecotech project. And I said, this sounds great. So our first year we started with seven species of hickories. Um, and it's been a learning curve because they're, there's no one in the Northeast who's growing native, um, local ecotypic flowers under a commercial situation. In other words, we're growing them in plots of 200 plants with the sole purpose of bringing them to maturation and having them have a successful seed production so that then we can offer the seed. So then at the same time, we had to start realizing, well, where do we go from here? We can't grow all this all out. So we've been trying to contract with nursery growers to see if they would be interested in purchasing seed, growing it out, and then making the plugs available to the, to the public. We've done some plant sales through Aspatuck, which has done some of that. We work um, with Planters Choice in Newtown. They're doing some of it. Uh, but this is new. It's four years. So we're still expanding it. Uh, just this past fall, um, Dina finally got the licensing that um, she has an official seed company now that's called Eco 59. So she had, there's a, a lot of hoops you have to go through to actually sell seed. You have to do germination testing on everything and all of that. So we've been doing that. Um, we're, we're up to seven farms that are now part of the Ecotech project in Connecticut, mostly in Western Connecticut. It's expanding. There's a burgeoning interest in this, and so lots of emails are coming in. And again, it's another, kind of another management position, but uh, we're also trying this year to kind of focus the energies back into Ridgefield too, as far as how can we, you know, help take care of our hometown too in some way with this. So, and there's an initiative that uh, a couple of folks from the Conservation Commission are putting forward in town to try to have the town have a requirement that a certain percentage of plants on town properties when they're doing things would be native plants. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that are being done. It's a question of how all comes together. So. But if you want to learn more, uh, sign up for Tuesday, because we'll, we'll be talking. I'll be there, Dino, it's a Zoom, but I'll be there, Dino will be there, and Sephra Alexandra, who's also been a real lead on the Ecotech project, will all fail to be participating in that talk. Can you reveal what which plants you are growing for seed? Oh boy, you're gonna give me a memory test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Abby, help me out. Okay, well done. let's see. We have we have um, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, common milkweed. We have ironweed, Joe pie weed. We have cardinal flower. We have white aster, blue aster. Um, the golden rod. What's the golden rod name? Uh, rough, 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 um yarrow. Yeah, it's yarrow. a common white yarrow. Um, yarrow. We have uh, um, black eyed Susans, we have monkey flower, and little blue sun. And white without. So that's what we are growing currently. Some of the other farms we had two you know, we had two mints, um, actually three mints. Uh, the mints not been happy at the hickories. It's like the easiest plant. Most of us can't get rid of it from our yards, right? And we cannot grow it at the hickories for our life. I mean, I've tried moving it to different locations. It's like, ah, uh, we have one that has folium. It's still doing a little bit okay by the virus. Um, but there's another farm on the hilltop that's doing really well with the mints. So they are also an ecotype farm. And so they they are they have some species that we don't have, and that's kind of our long-term goal 
You know, we can't grow every native wildflower. It's physically impossible. So the ideal would be that we get a number of farms and that we would all kind of have slightly different plants so therefore the availability of how many species are available would increase. So that's all kind of cool. one farm loses the species that somebody else has it. And we're, we're trying to work with Native Plant Trust to develop a, a seed bank for the Northeast so that if you have um, you know, a wildfire that takes out um, an, like an open space or a, a field that you have local even type seed that's been banked that you can access to, again, amplify the seed production from. So there's a lot of aspects to it and we're still figuring it out. And I would say if you're interested, by all means, you know, come, ask questions. You know, we are constantly asking right questions. Yeah. This past summer, we had a Kim Stoner and a team from the Connecticut Ag Expired Organization at the farm. They came once a week. They were doing bee surveys. Um, I'm hoping that that report's going to be coming out pretty soon, that that's going to give us a report for how many bees were they seeing, what was the productivity. I will say this, that from, you know, Dean and I were amazed. When we first put in these seven plants, and so one right by the road, when we first approached the farm, it used to be under production. There were annual flowers there and there were vegetables there. So there were plants there and there were flowering plants there. We tore those out and we put in these perennials. That season, that first season, first of all, we didn't even expect that we were going to get flowering or seed production that year because for perennials, you usually have about a two-year settling in time, right? We had flowers, we had seeds, which was like, oh my god, what are we going to see? We thought that was going to be year two. <laughs> so that, that, that time scale went on the door. But we were blown away with the pollinators that showed up that first season. And to this day, I still marvel at that because it's like, how did they know? Like those plants were never there. How did they know? And then how did the word get out? That you literally have, I mean, like there would be thousands of bees and butterflies. Like that place is magical. I mean, Abby, <laughs> some days we don't get a lot of work done. Because <laughs> I just sit in the middle of the black eyed Susan and just listen to all the bee activity because it's just buzzes by you. It's wonderful. And hummingbirds yeah, and birds. You know, once the seed starts going to set, then like, you know, then we're trying to gather the seed before all the birds do, but we do try to share it. But this but, is something that that is really important because this is what we found is that you get more pollinators and more um, nectar seeking insects that really do rely on native only. And if we're putting in other plants, you know, from garden centers and so forth, which are beautiful, and yes, they do serve a little bit of a purpose and they do produce a little bit of nectar but it's not the overall entire type of nectar that certain insects need. They absolutely need a particular kind. So it's great to put natives into your garden to get that going, even if it's just one plant this year, and the next year you do a couple more. It, it's, it really is something that's great within a community because once you do it and your neighbor does it, then the insects have that pathway. And to like piggyback on what Abby just said about the variety, I always have to bring up this story about, you know, because Abby's ever the noticing the insects. So she says to me one day, Team, we have a chafer beetle problem out in the white wood essays. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> All right. What's that about? I was like, so what do, what do we have to do about this? And you said, we're going to go out into the field at night and pick them off. <laughs> so I bought a headlamp <laughs> and so that's what we did. We started showing up. Usually on a Friday night, yeah. I would text Dina warning her that we're out in the field with our headlamps. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody stealing tomatoes. <laughs> and, um, but why don't you talk about what happened on those nights? Yeah, so those nights were big really, really fun because you're going out at 9, 10 o'clock at night when all of us are in bed. And yes, we started to pick those insects off of those plants. We put them in some soapy water to get rid of them. 
But along the way, you were not just finding those, you were finding moths and all sorts of different kinds of insects that literally utilize the plants at night. So if you're thinking about a moth coming to your home, into the light, you're like, oh gosh, get these moths out of here. They are abundant in these fields just utilizing the nectar on all of these plants, and there's hundreds of them. There's, there's every kind of everything that you can think of that would be nocturnal is out there, including praying mantises in abundance. Um, spiders. Spiders, these huge spiders that just come out and are magnificent colors. And it's really a whole different magical place to be. And plus we saw they talk about our favorite eggs. I mean, oh yes. Lace wings or it's a, it's an insect that feeds mostly on aphids during during the day, but it comes out at night and this one had um, laid eggs and the eggs actually are like tiny strands with a tiny little egg at the end of them. And in our headlamp, they were brilliantly lit up. And so Jean shines the light and I take pictures. For tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> move, move, move that headlamp a little bit. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. It's fun. We've done that for two years running. So. And what we would, what we did was like we would actually mark because this this was actually on the swamp milkweed and yeah. else. We we would mark the plant. We go back during the day. And you know, we you couldn't see. We could not see them. Oh, yeah. It was, it was just there. incredible. Yeah. They were there, and like we could finally find them. But like the way that the headlamp, there's something about them that has this iridescence, and maybe you know, I don't know, it ties. There's a reason yeah. somewhere. I don't know what it is, yeah. but. Um, it was incredible what we could actually see. And the same with the spiders, their their eyes glow bright red in the headlamp. So we we you'd see all these eyes looking back at you. Who is that? Yeah. 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 Have you had a chance to do any paintings based on those yet? No, not on those. But I, I think that would be another one, the next one. Yeah. And would yeah. that be a different type of I mean your your the botanical ones are very similar type of colors yes. and things like yeah. that. This sounds like the lighting would be very lighting different. Lighting is a little different. It is a little different. It's a little bit more stark and brighter. Mm -hmm. And then your background is, is faded out to a dull black. So mm -hmm. it definitely would be a real challenge. It would be fun to do. Mm -hmm. Her photographs are amazing. Mm -hmm. They really are. I was wondering, yeah. uh, have you talked with like the universities? like? UConn, their agricultural department, are they involved with any of the things you're doing? You know, right now they're, they're not, but we, we would like to more. Um, we need, like, entomologists, we need botanists, we need all these things. And, and the sad truth is, is there's not a lot of those programs in existence anymore. And nor are there a lot of people studying it at a time when it seems that we need them most. Um, but yeah, we are always open to, you know, folks that are doing graduate work, undergraduate work, that need field work. Uh, because again, it's a mutually beneficial, it's a collaboration, and we have to collaborate. You know, we can't possibly learn the knowledge that's needed in those fields. We can't, and we readily acknowledge that. And so we're, we are hoping to bring more folks on board. Um, the, the Native Plant Trust, uh, we were in, we've been in contact with a couple of people there, and there's some programs, you know, in Massachusetts where there's some folks doing doctoral work that do need field sites, and so we might be able to get some. Like I said, we had Kim Stoner's group come up from uh, the Ag Station, but, you know, we're going to be reaching out more to, to WestCon, maybe to PACE. We've been utilizing WestCon and PACE on the Natural Resources Inventory that I'm helping with as part of being on the Conservation Commission. Um, and we've been tapping them to do a lot of our field work for that, which again is another way. You can't be an expert in everything. You can't. It's impossible. So you, you need this team effort. And, you know, I can see you trying to circle back to them. I don't want to over tap their resources, but I would love to have them get involved at the Hickory Institute to help, you know, look at some of these questions. Because, you know, one of the other questions for on the farm side of things is that, and we haven't been able to fully answer this, is that 
you know, now that we've brought these plants onto the farm and we have this variation of pollinators arriving, you know, how has it impacted the pollination levels at the farm? And right now, it's almost hard to answer that question because we're four years into it. You know, we're like, that's a great, like, dissertation question for somebody to start with one of the newer farms that's just starting you can have a comparative to like before they they were there what what was the health of the farm and what is it you know four or five years down the road when these plants have been in place and i mean we think of questions like this on a daily basis so that we could be we could be supplying a university full of dissertations yeah. <laughs> if you know anybody who wants who needs work send them our way <laughs> thank you yeah Gene, the seed bank program you referred to earlier, is that something that is being initiated very locally? Or is there a, a regional approach to it? Is the country doing anything about it? Good question. Um, again, it's, it, it seems to be that people are waking up and, and things are starting to happen. Um, so uh, Dina actually just awarded a, a very nice grant through a program that she did to so help sustain this program a little bit forward. The seed bank, right now the seed bank is in Brooklyn, and it's not really, they don't have a need of a plant division. They do a lot of other seed banking for everything. As we know, we need seed for all the food we eat, and all, you know, all of this stuff, trees, shrubberies. You know. um, and it's kind of figuring out where the seed bank can be built, how it can be funded, and where can it be placed. Um, we have a small seed bank at Hickory's in a little college refrigerator <laughs> that is our backup supply. Should we have, you know, storm damage and lose a crop there? So, like, we have to have a backup plan. So we do keep um, seed there. But there, that's where this conversation is starting to happen with the Native Plant Trust. And there seems to be interest in that. If that ends up following through, it'd probably be based in Massachusetts somewhere. It's a question of funding, building the facilities, having someone oversee it. And, it, and it's a lot of you know logging in, and you got to be very specific from where the seed is coming from, what was the seed that was grown, you know, all of that. So is this a northeast? Northeast, basically. Yeah. Northeast. So, what is the geography of the native plant? In other words, is a native seed in Richfield a native seed in Boston? Really good question. So, you know, and I, and I think this is like another one of those, you know, as gardeners and things like that, you know, like, well, wait a minute, I just learned that I had to have native plants in my yard. Now you're telling me that, like, not all natives are created equal. Like, what's this about? <laughs> And like that's the truth. There is a difference in the ecotype. So um, I'm going to just back up a little bit, and I'll answer to your question. Okay. So typically, if you go to a lot of places like larger box stores, and you buy a plant, and you go in there, and you buy, let's say, like a black eye susan or um, an echinacea plant, and you bring it home, and you put it in your yard, and it does well for a year. And guess what? Year two doesn't look so good. It's not doing very well. What's happening to it? You're free. It might not even make it. And you're like, what's going on? A lot of that stock is actually being grown from seeds that comes out of the Midwest or the Southeast. Those plants bloom at different times. The pollinators are there at different times of the year. Local ecotypic plants evolved with the insect species of the Northeast that emerge from the ground, from their cocoons, at certain times, the plants aren't blooming at that time. It's not a match. And it's not going to work out. So how is it divided out? It's divided out into something called ecoregions. And there's actually an ecoregion map. <clears throat> and if you look at the Ecotech project online under CT Nova, you'll see that there's a map there. And what's interesting is we're in ecoregion 59. And it kind of encompasses like a little bit of New York, it encompasses parts of Connecticut, parts of Massachusetts, parts of New Hampshire, parts of Maine. And it's all based on climate, soil type, like all of those things. So that any of the plants that are grown in that region should do well in any part of that region. 
But it also brings us to this larger question of a warming planet. And to make gardens sustainable in Eco 59, do we also need to be looking at the eco regions that are slightly south of us and starting to incorporate some of those plants you know, into our gardens? So in other words, like Long Island is a different eco region um, than we are in Connecticut, especially the south shore of Long Island. A microcosm. So go back to the micro and macro. So instead of like, you know, buying your plants that were grown, you know, in Indiana or in South Carolina, you're gonna have a much better success rate and meet the needs of the pollinators more if you're buying your plants that are locally seed sourced local plants. And to go back to that message of micro and macro, if each of us is a little bit on our little micro lawn, it's gonna influence the health of the macro ecosystem overall. And there's only a few places, you know, in the area that you can get those plants from. And so it's best to look into, you know, the local um, land trusts. Well, they sell the native plants as well as, um, what would you say, hickories, of course, and sells the seed. Just so that you're absolutely getting an eco and if, you, and if you don't do your own garden, if you have folks who come and do stuff for you, you know, it's supply and demand. It's like we used to walk into the grocery store and you never saw organics. People started demanding it and saying, do you have any organic produce? Do you have this? And lo and behold, they realized there's a market. We can make money from this. Let's start putting organics in. Mm -hmm. It's the same true, you know, with the grocery stores for your lawn. So, like, if you're dealing with a lawn care company, are they using organic practices? You can control pests organically. You don't need to be using these high impact pesticides. So there's like all of these things that even if you're a hands off person, there's still things that you can do by making sure that people who walk onto your property are doing things that are ecologically sound. And you can source, like through Plant Just Choice, you can source beds, you know, plots of plants that are local ecotypes that a landscaper can put in. So they're, but we are hoping to expand that. I mean, the, the hickories has some stock that we'll be offering this year, but we're hoping to, again, it's so early in the process and we need to get people in the pipeline, these nursery growers and commercial outlets that see that there's a need. And uh, one of our, our biggest supporters in all this has been the pollinator pathway. And if any of you are on that, kudos to you, because it's the pressure from the pollinator pathway people that's starting to really awaken this commercial industry to say, oh, wait a minute. You know, I've had four people walk into my um, yard this week asking, do I have, you know, local native plants? And I don't, so what am I gonna do about it? So it's really important, and again, it's that collaboration that has to happen. Yeah, you know, it's getting specific. If I were to go to Stu Leonard's perennial apartment, and I see something grown by the land provide white flower form or whatever. My major reaction is, oh, this is a good thing. Is it a good thing to buy one of those plants in your local? It's kind of a tricky question. Um, yes, in concept, you, I would agree with you. Um, the, the bigger question is we don't know where the seed source is coming from. Is it coming from Ernst? coming from, like, Ernst is pretty good, they're mm -hmm. fairly, but a lot of these big seed companies, again, it's the Midwest. They're growing massive amounts of seed and they're shipping it out to these places. If white flower, Hudson Valley seed is another good example, okay? Hudson Valley seed, a lot of their stuff, they've grown it there long enough and they harvest the seed on site. So you're dealing now with more of a localized plant, even though its genetics might have been from somewhere else. So, like, does, it kind of, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's complicated. It's really complicated. You know, I guess it's the best thing to do is ask and then make your decision from there, you know, because if you if you have the information um, that you need to ask the question, where where is the seed source from? I know it's a local um, organization. Is the seed still coming from this area? You know, and if they don't know, you can call the companies you know, and find out. Hopefully it's going to get easier. Right? That's, that's kind of the goal. You know, that's our goal is to try to, if we can get this 
this nursery thing lined up a little bit more, um, is that it will be easier. That you'll eventually, hopefully, be able to go somewhere and you'll see eco ticket. And you'll see like, yeah. like right, like in the seed that you buy, if you, if you were to go to the hickories or go through the, it's not really the hickories, it's just say the Eco 59 mm -hmm. seed company. When you get a seed packet from them, some of them will say that it's sourced from the hickories. Some might say Wallenberg or it might say Hilltop. Because what we do is we bring in the seed from these seven farms and we bring it in, but we're, we're keeping it autonomous mm -hmm. so that but you know directly where it's done grown. Yeah. And then we also save the site from where it was collected. So it was collected in Redding, it was collected in Brookfield. Like we have that lineage. And so that's the thing that isn't clear in a lot of these other commercial enterprises. It's like, what's your lineage? You know, it's like how now you can like scan your blueberries and it shows you where they travel. <laughs> you know, it's like, that doesn't really exist for plants yet, but that's like what we need. It's like. You know, where did they come from? Are these from South America? Like, where did they come from? Yeah. There's a place in, I think it's Woodbury. Is it Earthbound? Earth Tone. Earth 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 Great yeah. choice, good place to go. Really good. Yeah. And, and when you talk about it in the area, I'm sure that <coughs> my skills are not very good with confusions, but if I do go echo area, you could you could Google the um, the map for the eco regions. Okay, and then you will be able to okay. get a list of plants. You better bet is to go through Dead Get Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. or Xerxes. Okay. Xerxes Society has an, also a great list of plants on their site. But again, they're dealing with just plants, so it's not necessarily dealing with where source of those. So like they're going to say, you know, Black Eyed Susan, Echinacea or something, because they're not going right. to say. And that's what I said. Exactly. And, you know, and that's where it's, it, you know, unfortunately with so much of this stuff, it, it's about becoming an educated consumer. Yeah. That's really what it's about. And there's a lot more than, it, there's a, once you do it and you see results, for better or for worse, you realize how much more is involved with just buying it. And, you know, and I think, you know, Abby brought up a really <clears throat> important point, too, is it's like, even just one plant makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have a small apartment, you get a pot, you put it on your patio. It's going to make a difference. Like, it's stunning the difference that it makes. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we live on a third of an acre. Um, first got there, there was, like, not a lot of plantings, and most of it was, like, farm berry and you know, <laughs> stuff that shouldn't be there. I still have some of those plants in my yard, you know, 14 years later, because it's been a gradual transition. Where I'm gradually adding natives, um, doing some, you know, sustainable collection practices of, of natives that are on public lands and growing them out, and and then doing other things like leave the leaves. Sounds like a minor thing, you know, people don't like it, but since I started doing that. I've been amazed at the increase in the number of nesting birds that I have on a third of an acre. Last summer, there were five nesting birds, all different species, on that third of an acre. And I honestly feel that the reason why is because there were ready food sources in that acre for them. And the native plants were there for seed, for pollen, all the insects so they could eat insects and the larva were there, emerging larva for them to feed their young. So it's, it's, it's this larger picture of trying to understand. You know, I think we're never, <laughs> we're never going to understand how complex our world is. We don't have the capacity for it. I honestly believe that. We scratch the surface and in hope that we're doing things that are better and they're not hurtful. I, I see a big difference um, for the plants I've got, let's say, from White Flower Farm versus when I'm trying to save a little money and go to Home Depot <coughs> or Costco, but they look pretty, you know, as a gift. Big, big difference. Uh, they, you know, they're healthy, they, they come back. Uh, and other friends have said the same thing. I mean, even house plants have had amaryllis that are just gorgeous, that, you know, so, uh, you know, I, that's in Litchfield. 
Yeah, there. I mean, that's a beautiful place to go visit. If you want to it. it's 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 great. But you know, and that brings back to the point that a lot of those larger companies they're contracting from way not in our eco region. And then the other thing is, a lot of those plants are treated. Bag. Yeah. They grow on their with nameless materials, I won't go into that wormhole, but that are actually detrimental to the insects in your yard. And they're doing that so that their stock looks great all the time and doesn't get infestations of aphids and all that other stuff, but you're bringing a plant on it in essence has a toxic component now in it. Because it's, 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 it's not that they're just spraying it on the outside. They're using it in the soil so that it will go into the flower itself and into the leaves. Mary, ask you, let's say you get something from a business, and again, you're bringing it to your home now, and you're doing, you're, you're, you're now going very healthy about everything with that plant. Are you are we making a difference then? Even though it wasn't originally done totally properly, or you know, when you're getting bulbs, when you're getting that's oh, you take that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't hear the whole thing, so if because uh, I couldn't hear you through I'm your sorry. Mask. I was oh. saying, let's say you buy plants from a pretty reputable, but as you're saying, there's other elements to the growing of that plant. And now you're buying bulbs and different things, and you bring them to your home, and you're very organic, or you're doing things as properly as you can that you're planting your own plants. Can you kind of change the development, whether for the first year or the second year, a, a, a fruit tree or you it know something? It depends on the plant, and I think that as it depends on the plant because the genetics of the plant are there within it. And it's a little difficult to change those genetics. You can over time. So it depends on the plant. If you if if it's a certain type that will be happy in that space with the light, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I think it would probably thrive. And maybe the genetics would change a little bit if there's another plant that's more on the native side somewhere else oh, close good. by where the insects are going back and forth. It's very uh, like if it was grown locally, but you're saying there's other things that may be hindering it, but it's still yeah. local yeah. and better than what we're getting. It's a better choice. choice. It's a better choice for sure. sure. Yeah. And, that, and that's one of the things that you'll see on um, through the Ecotype project is there's actually, you know, kind of like a schematic that's kind of developing about, you know. You can't do perfection. It doesn't yeah. exist. But like, what's the better choices? You know, and that's yeah. it. And the toxicity level of something that's been treated, it has been found to reduce over time, but it's just the worry of the introduction of putting that out into your, into your garden. You know? So you, know, you do the best yeah. you can. We all do the best we can. Yeah. You know, that's the bottom line. And any one plant yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. So. And for example, you know, there's the <coughs> echinacea plants that are not pink. They're more orange or yellow. Well, yellow, some, some natives are yellow. But they're orange and just bright, bright pink. And it's been bred into the plant. And if you put that in your yard, and it looks fantastic. But I'm telling you, not a bee will go on it. Not one native insect will, will go to that plant. And that plant will not survive the next year. It won't come up well. So it's an interesting. Because they're not. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, their genetics are not like the, the bees don't know that that's what they should yeah. do. And to circle back to the, our night surveys, these plants have a very different look at night and they reflect back these other lights, other wavelengths. Yeah. So some of these you know, colors have been manipulated. Are probably not, right. they're not seen literally, probably by right. some of the insects. Right. Could I ask Karina one last question? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Karina, what, what are we going to be working on next in your last work? <laughs> or, or do you know? <laughs> I guess I don't know, but uh, generally, 
create a project based on where I go, what are the local materials. Um, I work a lot with recycled glass, so probably whatever I find that inspires me. When you say recycle, you go out in the fields and pick up the stuff? Or? Well, I guess recycle. When I was in Murano, Italy, I used to scatter small piles of glass. So probably recycle bottles, which are more applicable here, or um, finding ways to produce a, a carbon footprint because a lot of things, especially with what's happening on the earth right now, Murano gas prices have gone 40% up. Spend some time with the show and remember upstairs. Stop and visit the Remorse Building exhibition. And uh, if you want to talk to any of us, you can talk to us at any point.